we call Genesis the beginning of these things. This text is the eighth in our series entitled, What God Loves. Its intent, of course, is to enlarge our understanding of the reality that God loved righteousness prior to his making and loving people in his image. Righteousness has always been the focus of his attention. It always has been because it's in his nature. This is what he's like. It's not just something that he does. It's the, the, the righteous acts of God is an expression of who he is. And he will not compromise that righteousness, even for those made in his image. Now, the scriptures are, are, are abundantly clear on this matter. And that's especially when men abandon the purpose for which he has made them. Now, those with faith want to be led in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. They rejoice in the reality that God, that the Lord God loveth righteousness and judgment. The judgment is a, is a, a, just a little other aspect of his righteousness. Moreover, they are glad that the one whom God sent from his presence to walk the earth as a man, the scripture says, loveth righteousness and hateth wickedness. We know he demonstrated this in his life. His, his life of godly behavior and his words affirm this, this revelatory report. Thy righteousness also, O God, is very high. very high. Who has done great things, O God, who is like unto thee. Yeah. Scripture is a record attesting to God's righteousness in all his sayings and his doing, first in Israel. Mm -hmm. First to the children of Israel. The Genesis record highlights his involvement with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look at it, chapters 12 through 50. That's right. 42 chapters of a 50-chapter yeah. record <laughs> concern these three men. That's right. And God's and, and those are only highlights, by the way. Yeah. Uh, there, there's certainly an enormous amount. Uh, who could record all of the things that took place during these years that this record covers? Those associated with them in and out of the land that God promised them, his promises, his purpose, his agenda to fulfill them, drives these events mm -hmm. that Brother Moses recorded of the fathers and God's work. Jacob's family went down to Egypt, a free nomadic tribe of 70 plus. Yeah. They returned to Canaan just over four centuries later, a nation of millions forged in that furnace of slavery. Yeah. <clears throat> God extended his strong arm and bent Egypt to his will. That's right. mm. They refused, and then they bent. Yeah. Mm. Amen. They brought Israel out of that furnace in one day with all the riches of the land, right. didn't he? Yeah. Take them, take them, they said. Just leave. All the years, those, those, their salaries for all those years, that generation. But centuries prior to that, Isaac was born in Canaan, and he never departed that place. In fact, God directed him, do not leave, and he did not. God promised that land to his father, then to him, then to his son Jacob, whose name was changed by an angel. To Israel, Prince of God. God. God fulfilled that promise of the departure, as we mentioned. It, it was his agenda. Yet many did not believe. And so their their personal benefit in that event was very short lived. Didn't last long. <clears throat> And then centuries later, God would remove them from that land and take from them the good things that he had granted them. Now such divine choices, divine choices, as granting them that land and then removing them from it, they're some of the foundation blocks of God's revealed righteousness, mm -hmm. which he makes known in the earth by the scripture records that we believe and hold sacred this moment. Mm, yes, yes. 
This is a divine record. So we'll give attention this morning to this section of the record, especially because Brother Paul highlights some of the words from this record in his letter to the church in Rome. Now that's the portion where Brother Paul answers the uh, challenge perhaps, maybe just in the thinking of his readers. We don't know that anybody actually said these things. But what of Israel's general unbelief? toward God's promises. Did his agenda fail? Did God fail them in some way? Was he not able to do what he said he would do in some way? Because we know, well, this account of Esau and Jacob, it's hard to think of those brothers in that way, isn't it? Esau and Jacob, we don't think of them that way, do we? It, it was, I, yeah, as, as, I, as I wrote that, <laughs> I thought, I'm not sure if I've ever written their names in that order before. Why? Because of God's righteous determination, that's why, that he himself chose. They didn't. They did not choose. But he did. Now this synchronizes with our Bible lesson this morning, doesn't it? This thought of God's working and the revelation of his will. The account of Esau and Jacob teach us much of God's present purpose and will to fulfill it in the church of the firstborn yes. to which yes. we've been called. Now, this record, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, recounting the record. We know it. Isaac, in this matter of he and Rebekah's childbearing, 20 years, almost, almost 20 years. He was 40 when they married. He was 60 when the boys were born. He believed God's promise to his father, yeah. who, by the way, was still alive. Yeah. Brother Abraham was still alive. In fact, he lived until those boys were approximately 14 or 15 years old. Had plenty of time, many days, for grandfather Abraham to tell Jacob and Esau of the Lord's dealings with him. And his, pardon me, his wisdom and his goodness. Now, God was faithful all these decades, all these years. 100 years. 100 years since God had called him to the day of his death. God had been faithful in all things. Years to recount the details that we don't have. Of God's dealings, particular episodes of their walking together. Observations of the years from Father Abraham. So Sister Sarah's death and Isaac and Rebecca's marriage were 20 years in the past. They remained childless. Now childbearing, heir, producing an heir, of course, was critical and key to this matter of God's promise. And God arranged this, didn't he? so that they would personally experience his work in them as Abraham and Sarah yeah. did. Amen. To fulfill this promise to Abraham, who was still in their tents during that 20 years. And this answer to Isaac's prayer affirmed God's sovereignty in these promises, even as in Abraham and Sarah's sojourn. Amen. So in time, God's time, after the intercession, Rebecca was with child. However, however, there was something more. And she sensed it in herself, didn't she? And of course, that's always the case when God works in his people. There's something more that, that they uh, didn't see at first or couldn't know couldn't know until God revealed these things. So she knew the source. She went to ask the source of this puzzling condition. She recognized that God had done this. They had waited patiently, not quite so long as did Abraham and Sarah. And they had not done anything as to the flesh, had they, like, like Hagar. Now, that's no reflection on Brother Abraham and Sister Sarah because they, they did what they did in faith as did Rebecca later 
Later, she would do something in faith as well that a lot of people have criticized her for. But she did it in faith. 20 barren years. Now, with a full womb, fuller than she knew, something was troubling in her. In a full and lively womb. Lively in, in a not ordinary sense. All of you sisters have uh, felt the movement of a child. A couple of you, the movement of more than one. But you didn't know for a while. And that was the case here. So she went to the Lord and received an answer that was stunning. What was working in her was not just childbearing. Not just the fulfillment of their hopes and desires. It was fulfill, the fulfillment of God's promise and his working for generations to come. In fact, his working out of part of his eternal purpose was in her, in her womb. Now, she didn't know those details. We're able to look back and see this because of the greater revelation granted to us. See, so there's a greater responsibility incumbent upon us as well. God has often worked through childbearing to bring someone into the earth for a special commission, Isaac himself. Now, Jacob and Esau, that's the way that comes out of your mouth, doesn't it? Jacob and Esau. <laughs> Naturally, my whole life, it's come out that way. All the years that I've taught from these things and read these things. Moses sent into the earth a special child. Samson. Obed. Son of Ruth, yeah. grandfather of King David, yeah. yeah, Solomon, Isaiah's children, yeah. named for his uh, message, his preaching, John the Baptist, each according to God's timing, God's power, God's direction. There's, there's a striking truth that resides in this matter of begetting life, not biology, but spiritual Reality that looms large in types and shadows that took their place in God's revelation. Some of the exposition of these things are in these statements. First from the master himself. That night. When an elder of Israel came to him. Jesus answered and said unto him. Verily, verily, I say unto thee. Except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Brother James writes these words to us that are very familiar to us. Of his own will, he, of his own will begat he us yeah. with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Yeah. Of his own will. Of his own, of his own will. will. Brother Peter chimes in then, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Now, these are only a few statements. And the last one, of course, is one that we've mentioned uh, a couple of times today already, I think, or one connected to it. We know that whoever is born of God sinneth not. He that is begotten of God keepeth him, and that the wicked one toucheth him not. We have mentioned that text several times this morning, haven't we? So God worked and revealed and staged his purpose of life and truth from above in the lives of the fathers by their faith in his revealed wisdom and promises, though they didn't know the details, as we do now. But their trust was profitable, personally profitable to them, and more than that profitable to us. So this double birth is unusually prominent in the later exposition of God's salvation, isn't it? This is the text that Brother Paul goes to in dealing with this matter of what about Israel and their rejection of these things. Two peoples wrestling in the womb. They were different, not the same. Though twins in flesh, they were not twins in spirit. They were, they were not even twins in the flesh or the commonality of the appearance of twins, were they? Hairy, one was hairy and red, mm -hmm. the other no hair and not red. Mm -hmm. So you could tell them apart. Yeah. Even by appearance, you could tell them apart. That's just right. That's right. And yet they were in the womb together. Yeah. 
Think of that now. One was hairy, the other was smooth. So, the message to Sister Rebecca was, two nations, this is the focus of this message this morning, two nations are in their womb, in your womb. This, this is the text that Brother Paul quotes. Two nations are in thy womb, two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. The one people shall be stronger than the other people. The elder shall serve the younger. See, God defines all of this himself, although the details are not stated here. The one and the other, stronger over the weaker. Earth is a place where this, feels, where, where this idea of, of domination is demonstrated every day in practical ways, in economics, uh, social life, intelligence, physical strength and prowess, uh, athletics, uh, the financial world, uh, the business world, the political world, among the nations, so this is demonstrated, the stronger over the weaker. By these things, hearts are sifted, hearts are revealed as to their interests, their values. Esau, he was prominent. Everyone knew he was the firstborn. They, that, that was critical in their culture, see. Now, there's no, there's no revelation from heaven about these things. There's no law about these things of the firstborn at this point. But he was prominent, firstborn, aggressive. He was capable in things that mattered to daily survival of, of uh, provisions, the, the uh, uh, providing of provisions. And, and uh, Jacob, well, he was behind the scenes, wasn't he? But he was also capable because somebody has to be able to take care of those provisions and to transfer them from their raw, you might say their, their raw condition, into something that's usable. Well, Jacob was, Jacob was the one who did that. So in those early years, both had their places, yet these were only temporal. And we know little details about, except the recorded highlights of each man. But Rebecca appears to understand all through the years. She seems to understand the spiritual nature of these things, as women often do, and how they play a key role behind the scenes. And those women play a key role behind the scenes to, to, to guide the bent of a child's heart. Yeah. The elder will serve the younger. And again, there's, there's no revealed divine laws at this point in this matter of inheritance. And we know that God's ways are not man's ways. Man's ways are not God's ways, are they? And God endorses no human contrivance. There are many who have taught down through the generations that God just incorporates what men did. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. His ways are not man's ways. He states that categorically and specifically in all kinds of ways. And this is especially true when something man does challenges his purpose and seeks, even unknowingly, to upset it. It's not going to be... It's not going to be. God's going to get his way. Amen. Yeah. He, God did not, has never granted fathers, even these fathers, power of themselves to make these decisions, have they? If that were the case, then Father Isaac's decision would have dominated, wouldn't it? But it doesn't. His decision does not dominate. His preference did not dominate. However you want to define it. So God intervened through Rebecca and watched over his word to keep it even as he does today. They knew, didn't they? About Uncle Ishmael. He was firstborn. They also knew about the six sons of Keturah who did not participate in the inheritance. They were sent away. They knew about that. You see, firstborn is not in time when it comes to God's promises. It's by rank. And God establishes the rank. Always has, always will. Very clear in Scripture. He's not confined to time and earthly orders. 
why God can make a brand new man awake from creation, fully equipped to function in thought and speak and engage his identity. He hits the ground so running, so to speak, without the need of training from an elder human experience. And yet morally, weak. And at the first point of opposition, he falls. Yeah. This is not so as to believers. See, believers are made strong and stable. They're made quick to learn as they walk in light and truth the Spirit teaches. See, the working of God teaches. So God brings this to pass. Many modern teachers, of course, we probably all heard it at one time or another. And maybe some of us have spoken it. I can't remember in particular that I have, but it, it's, I sure may have from this very spot over the years criticized and made harsh judgments. But God had spoken about this matter. Two nations, two manner of people. That's right. One stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. He had spoken. Amen. See? Amen. He didn't. He didn't say anything about how it would come to pass. And there is no editorial comments about Rebecca or Jacob's behavior. Is there? And, and there's, there's nothing. Nothing. It just states not, not even very much detail. <laughs> but enough to know what took place. Let us in this case, always remember these words. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Amen. Yeah. And, of course, God's the one that makes a righteous judgment known. And, by the way, let me ask some questions here. That Did Esau tell Father Isaac about this transaction, about this trade? You remember the trade, don't you? Yeah, the bowl of pottage. Did he tell him? Well, we don't know, do we? There's no record of it, is there? Did Mother Rebecca know? Might have Jacob told her? Maybe. We don't know for certain, but maybe because of her actions. It was a trade. It was a, it was a knowing, willing exchange, wasn't it? He didn't have to do it. Nobody forced him to do it. He really wasn't dying. He was just a man who was controlled by his appetites. Right. And he yielded himself yeah. quickly to whatever appetite came up, like we see people around us all the time doing. Oh, yeah. Don't yeah. We? Amen. They all knew, as I mentioned earlier, they all knew about Ishmael's displacement. He and Isaac lived for 120 years simultaneously. Ishmael and Isaac. 120 years. Of that 120 years, Isaac and Rebecca were married for 75 of that 120 years. They all knew. They all knew Ishmael's life. They all knew his tribe. They all knew his 12 sons, all princes, powerful men. See? And yet, who's the firstborn? Yeah. And not by Father Abraham's choice either. Not by Mother Sarah's choice either. But by God's choice. Amen. God's choice. That's, that's what the issue is here. So Rebecca received God's word by her prayer mm -hmm. while these sons were yet in the womb. That's Brother Paul's point, isn't it? Yeah. Her actions are in the light of the revelation yeah. of the Most High God, yeah. of which she did not have details. And yet she believed, just as Sister Sarah believed, and so she engaged Hagar by faith. Technically, she was wrong, but that was not counted against her, was it? No. Not at all. And this is not counted against Mother Rebecca either. No. Not at all. It's never once mentioned the details of this again. No judgment by Brother Moses as he recorded these things. No editorial. No explanation. Until we get to Brother Paul. There's where we get the real explanation, isn't it? The reality of the gospel. Now, Brother Paul's exposition of these things are in light of the gospel. 
This is where he picks up this text and brings it forward. In fact, I'm going to start reading here. Romans chapter 9, verses 7 through 16, if you want to turn to it. And he picks up, in fact, he picks up where God is speaking to brother Father Abraham about Ishmael's uh, departure. His uh, separation. He and his mother's separation from the tribe. Brother Paul picks up quoting that text. In Isaac, shall thy seed be called. Now this is where we get the editorial. Spiritual editorial, if you might say. That is, they which are, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, yes. but the children of promise are counted for the seed. Yes. You see, those are spiritual words from Brother Paul. Children of promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of the promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. Now that comes from back in chapter 18 or 17. Both. It's stated in different ways in Genesis 17 and 18. And not only this. Yeah. Now here's our text. Yeah. Not only this. See, he's piling on the, his case here. Yeah. The reason for his not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even our father Isaac, for the children being yet unborn, here's another ed story, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. Now that's another way of saying God's righteousness. See, it's just another way of saying that God would be proven righteous in all of his sayings and in all of his doings. That the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said to her, the elder shall serve the younger. Then he goes to Brother Malachi's writings. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Here's a real good question. What shall we say then? What do we learn from this? What does this mean to us? See, the scripture asks that question too, doesn't it? What's this mean to us? What shall we say to this? What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? <laughs> yes. God forbid. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Now that's from... Moses' record in Exodus. So then, here's his conclusion, so then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Now, brethren, we know, don't we, that that's our hope. That's our promise. That's our confidence that God shows mercy. But, of course, he has to have a firm and established reason to do so. And he does. So, let me highlight here to sum this up. These things about Brother Paul's key phrases and God's righteousness in this matter. The purpose of God, well, that's to glorify and justify himself in heaven and on earth and to save and work in fellowship with those whom he calls to himself according to election. Whom else but God? Whom else but God can make these decisions? By right and by power. Yeah. See, this is what we've talked about this morning yeah. in our Bible lesson. It's God's right and it's God's power. Mm -hmm. Could these things of God's redemption be random or of human decision? No, they couldn't be. Right. We've got hundreds of years of Israel making decisions, don't we? Mm -hmm. They're high priests and they're kings in their unfaithfulness mm -hmm. and only a tiny remnant remaining. Like in the days of the generation that came out of Egypt, and they took up stones to stone the two who believed and spoke. Of course, Brother Moses believed too, but there was not many of them who did. And yet they were the ones who went in. See, they were the ones who went in. That's God's decision contrasted with human decisions. See? Of him that calleth. He's the one that calls. Whom else but God could issue that call without compromise in righteousness? And his righteousness will not be compromised. Never has been. 
has not been to this day. He's compromised absolutely nothing. Amen. And his son demonstrated this. Who else but God could bring it to pass? Not just circumstances and random events. He made it happen this way. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. That's right. At the time he appointed. Right. Not at the time the Romans appointed. Because they had everything ready. Economically and socially. Not at all. God appointed all of that. See, yeah. Spoke about it through Brother Daniel. He brought it to pass in truth and wisdom and with power. He brought it to pass. Oh, Herod the Great, while all Jerusalem was upset because Herod was upset, weren't they? But God wasn't upset. Not at all. So when the time came, God just brought old Herod to himself. And he's been in his place ever since, hasn't he? Yeah. His time here on earth, just a blip. He himself, not even a blip. He's gone. He's gone. And he gave account for those innocent ones in Bethlehem. Yes, see. that's right. Yeah. He showed himself there, didn't he? The use of his power. So the purpose of God, according to election of him that calleth, and of God that showeth mercy, there's no other way, but that he do so toward we who are weak and sinful. He has to show us mercy. And he is willing. His kindness must be asserted or we will, we cannot, and we will not believe. Because the soul is at stake. The wrath of God stands before us. We will not believe unless we are certain to be received. And we are. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And we cannot believe except we are certain of God's provision. So brethren, in closing here. These kingdom and spiritual realities of God's choice, sovereign decision. I don't hesitate to say that. Not at all. Some, some may think statements like that will make people go to sleep. But that's not the case at all if their faith is genuine. Not at all. Some may go to sleep, but it's because they have no faith. These kingdom spiritual realities underpin the wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption that believers have in Christ Jesus. We've read that text twice this morning, haven't we, from 1 Corinthians. Yeah. How could it be otherwise, considering that God's righteousness and the revelation of this reality is at stake? Also we, even now, right now, we have two natures struggling in the womb of our bodies, don't we? Yeah. By his righteousness in Christ Jesus, the two are separated. The stronger prevails and the younger reigns by God's grace and his appointment. So he has made us believers his own righteousness in these things by our faith in and of his son, our savior, who is this moment at his right hand. This moment, he is there. And so we are glad and we give thanks. Thank you, brethren. God's grace and Amen. peace. Amen. Brother Aaron will have our exhortation this morning. Amen.